So my presentation today will be about superbugs. Malaria, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's. These are the sorts of images that people generally think about when they think about biological threats to people. In fact, if you go down to your local science fair and see what projects students are doing, it's going to be about generally one of these four topics. When they to oh, as and in and for that in that regard, they'll be talking about either some prognosis or a diagnosis tool, and they'll probably be using machine learning. Well, what is machine learning? Well, machine learning has come a long way since it first began. It first began as a sort of fun thing that um, is a sort of fun thing that students could simply talk about, and it's something that um, only programmers knew about. Machine learning has now developed from something that only used to do, uh, only used to identify, only used to identify neuroimaging models, and has now been able to identify different areas of text to speech. And students are also using machine learning in order to apply it in their own programs, creating diagnosis and prognosis tools for tumors of, say, the brain, the chest, and all throughout the body. But there's a new threat, one that is not that far off, one that is currently killing 700,000 people and is likely to kill 10 million people each year by 2050, a threat that the government and public are simply not giving the attention it deserves. Superbugs. So what exactly is a superbug? Well, it's simply an antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Well, what does that mean? It simply means that we've been so effective at using antibiotics for the past few decades that now there are bacterial cultures all throughout the world that are now resistant to every single type of antibiotic we have. And so you may be thinking, so what? After all, we can just create more antibiotics. We've been doing that for the past half century. Well, the problem is bacteria are now evolving at such fast rates that we simply won't be able to create antibiotics fast enough. There are different strains of bacteria for E. coli, for pneumonia, and all sorts of diseases all around the world. And they're all resistant to antibiotics in different ways. What this means is that we simply cannot use rudimentary technologies, technologies of the past, in order to take us into the future. Classical technologies, like those of antibiotics, are just that, a classic. They can be used in rudimentary and fundamental situations, but they won't be able to keep up with what evolution has brought us with superbugs. And this is where machine learning comes into play. Machine learning is not just applicable to computer models. It can be applied to biological processes as well. And this is something that I believe is the future for superbugs in order to combat superbugs using medicine. I'll be taking you through time, starting with the old but gold technologies that are now having new, new innovations, and then taking us into the innovations of the future. First, we have vaccines. Now, generally people know what vaccines are. After all, we've all had one, say the flu shot. A vaccine is simply when you take a pathogen and you insert it into an individual, and they concur an immune response that leaves behind some memory B cells. And these memory B cells are important simply because they allow for the next time that the pathogen enters into the system, it can allow for a response to happen much more quickly. The issue with this is that people only talk about viral vaccines. That's the, those are the ones that we generally know about. For example, the flu shot. What we don't realize is that there are other types of vaccines as well, especially ones for bacterial pathogens. Reverse vaccinology is a technology that is currently being used in order to create vaccines at a faster rate than ever before. Essentially, you take the genetic information of the proposed pathogen that you're looking for, and you're creating a speculative model of what this organism looks like. You don't, you've never isolated it in solution. You've never had it in vitro. It's just a model, but an effective one. Because you, you take that genetic code, you translate it into proteins, and then you separate out the proteins that are attached to the cell membrane. 
And these are the ones that are most important because MHC mechanisms in our, inside our bodies only can attach to and identify proteins on the surface of cells. So after we have these vaccines using reverse vaccinology, we can see that the trend for vaccines is going to go a lot more quickly. We've had 22 vaccines since 1980. And, this, and the, rate, the rate at which vaccines are going to be created is going to be a lot greater in the future. Furthermore, vaccines are preventative and not rehabilitative. What this means is that it doesn't allow for a bacterial pathogen to mutate within the individual once the person becomes infected. Vaccines work by taking the shot before you're infected with the disease. And so it prevents other mutations for superbugs from occurring in the future. I guess that technology is pretty interesting, right? But something that's even more exciting and it's coming in the near future is nanotechnology. I'm sure you guys have heard about graphene. It used to be a buzzword back in the day. And essentially, it's so easy to create that all you need is a block of graphite, like the lead at the tip of your pencil, and you need a piece of tape. And you can create this two-dimensional carbon material that is applicable across a wide variety of fields. In terms of medicine, this just means that we use a carbon oxide fiber, and we insert it into individuals in order to help with um, parsing out between different types of bacteria. See, usually when people think about technology being used in medicine, we think of either prosthetics for individuals, or we think about, say, something to help us with their hearing or with our vision. What we don't realize is that the most potent forms of technology that we can use in medicine are, naked to the, um, are, are invisible to the naked eye. For example, there was a study done two years ago in which a carbon-based structure was created with an oxide in order to determine between PA, KP, and E. coli types of bacteria. And it has to parse these sorts of bacteria out in our blood and separate them and terminate them. When an in vitro study was done with um, macrophages and, uh, this, and uh, the carbon oxide fibers, the KP was eradicated almost immediately. Furthermore, when these nanofibers were inhaled by mice and went into the bloodstream, it was able to prevent the spread of KP throughout the body, prevent inflammation, and save the lives of these mice. And this is something that's extremely fundamental and unique and links to machine learning actually pretty well. Because if we think of classification algorithms today, we think of um, a, a more rudimentary example is like one, uh, classifying between different numbers that are drawn on a piece of paper, like one, two, three, four, five. And we think of those components and we think, okay, so the number one is a line. We think of two with a curve and a line and so forth. Well, instead of having these components be lines on a piece on a page, we think of these as proteins on a cell surface, bacteria in the blood. This is how we can use machine learning in the future. Now, the most exciting form of technology that we have in the future is phage therapies. The thing that I like most about phage therapies is that they can go toe to toe with bacteria as bacteria evolve. Well, how does that work? Well, first, what is a phage? A phage is simply a virus that infects bacteria. Now, some of you may be thinking, but wait, like bacteria and viruses are on one side, and uh, humans, animals, plants, every other type of organism on the other side. We usually lump bacteria and viruses into the same group. Well, this is not necessarily true. After all, viruses, their only goal is to spread their genetic information, and they'll do that through bacteria. In fact, they have been doing that for billions and billions of years. So it only makes sense that we employ these phages as the best bet for us to fight superbugs in the future. It only makes sense that the most formidable foe of bacteria is what we can use to fight our most formidable foe, the superbug. What's key about phage therapy is that first, it can be parameterized. If you have a culture of, vi of viruses and the strain of a, sup of a superbug, in, a sort of, in an agar plate, and you can culture them in order to have, over multiple generations, a virus that can be resistant to the bacteria and infect the bacteria. The most common forms of that today are T4 phages in the lytic phase, and that's just a fancy way of saying that it's an extremely potent form of virus that interacts with the bacteria and kills it before it completes a, uh, completes a cell cycle. 
But what's even more important to realize is that not only can these be parameterized at the beginning, but as soon as you have the initial parameterization, I'm saying parameterization in order to connect between machine learning and um, the phage therapies that we have. Not only is it important, and not only is there a parameterization, but there's also a lack of interference later on. This is because phage therapies can evolve alongside superbugs. The virus that you have parameterized in order to prevent the superbug, something that's already evolved in order to um, be stopped against every single form of antibiotic we have, can in itself evolve, evolve to meet the new demands. It can feed off the information that is being received in order to come up with new solutions and new mutations in populations over and over in time. That means after you have a phage therapy once or twice, that strain of bacteria will have, will have someone to fight with, the phage, for its entire life and will likely be eradicated simply because the phage therapy evolves alongside the bacteria. In a machine learning algorithm, going back to that example with the numbers, if you have numbers one through eight and you have an algorithm that sorts all of them, it's like feeding in information about the number nine to make it more robust and then having that algorithm work. Except instead of a computer and a screen with a bunch of numbers, it's bacteria, viruses in our blood doing this every single day. When uniting in nanotech and phage, phage therapy, we can see that first, nanotech is able to parse out classifications, just like we do with machine learning algorithms. We see that phage therapy is able to evolve alongside information. Taking information from the superbug as it is right now, and as the superbug evolves, the phage can evolve alongside it. And it doesn't even need any help. You don't need to culture it in a solution. It'll do it on its own, because that is the biological process that drives change. So I guess what I'm saying is, with nanotechnologies that have fluorescent lightings to filter out between different types of bacteria, or with phage therapies, like the T4 lytic phage, that can evolve to meet the demands of superbugs, or with something as simple as a vaccine, which actually, was, um, actually recently created the meningococcus vaccine. The meningococcus vaccine being probably a vaccine you've already taken, it was created using the reverse technology that I had talked about earlier. These are things that are happening now in order to prevent the spread of superbugs into the future, in order to, prov in order to st uh, stay up to date with the superbugs as they evolve, and finally, to be able to unite the world of machine learning, the world in which we usually think of computers and computer design, with the world of medicine and biology, to be able to help save lives, to prevent the fact that 10 million people are likely to die of superbugs if such a problem is not fixed. We can understand machine learning better through biological systems and unite the two in order to create a more potent understanding of classifications and of life, of viruses and of machine learning. And this is where I think the future will take us. Thank you.